I would say Father Mark was preparing for exorcism, because even as a young man, he participated in the Civil War in Italy at the time, trying to free and protect his soul. So he already had a part of him that knew how to fight, he knew how to persevere. And I think that led into his priestly ministry, which was a great devotion. Hello, is anybody there? Hello.
Hello, anybody there? Hello. Can anybody hear me? Rita K. Hill, Colleen. I uh, guess not. Nope. I can hear them. Yeah. 
Oh, that's because I hit. No. 
I gotta put my mic on, don't I? <laughs> oh, it's put, I put it on the side this morning. Good morning to all of you. And to those of you in Zoom land, we welcome you. We're glad you're here. We're so glad that we can gather together. And I'm not normally on this side, but I am especially this morning because of the video that we're going to see in a moment. We will begin our worship service this morning, honoring those 700,000 people who died of COVID mothers and fathers, grandpas and grandmas, sons and daughters, sisters and brothers, husbands and wives, and dear friends, all who have died from COVID and the myriad of those left without them, greeting such devastating loss. In silence, we will watch a video, the tolling of the bells, if you were uh, following through on the Companions on the Way article this week, um, I included a section of that also. Tolling of the bells at the National Cathedral this past week, and we will join with those who grieve, even as we're going to see small white flags, 700,000 of them that represent those people who died. And we do so in compassion and in grace. Here now, the centering words of scripture that are a little different because I took them out of a book that I use for devotions called Psalms for Praying. And this is a section that comes from Psalm 17. O love divine, be thou our eyes so that we might see more clearly. Be thou our feet that we may walk along your paths so that we may be a benevolent presence on life's highway. Open our hearts so that loving and giving and compassion may be our companion.
Good morning. Welcome to Ogden Presbyterian Church, and we certainly extend a very warm welcome to those that are visiting with us here in the sanctuary or on Zoom, or maybe joining us later in the week on Facebook. As I was watching that, it made me really think that God's spirit was moving among them, among those flags that were waving. And I thought of that, um, because every time I hear wind chimes at my house, I always think it was my late husband just saying hello. And that's what I thought of when I saw the flags waving this morning, that that is God's spirit moving among them. Hopefully they're at peace. able, would you please stand and join in the call to worship with me? Let my whole being bless the Lord. Let everything within me bless God's holy name. Let my whole being bless the Lord. Never forget all God's Let us remember how God forgives all our sins, heals our sicknesses, and saves our lives from destruction. All creation, bless the Lord. Bless the Lord. 
And now we will sing hymn 132, Come, Great God of All the Ages. Please join with me the opening prayer. O oh, compassionate one, you reached from on high and drew us out of many waters. You delivered us from the fears that bind us, from the ignorance that blinds us, for they threaten to overcome us and separate us from you. You are the light in our lives, shining in our darkness. Your ways lead to wholeness, O loving presence. 
Your word is life to us. Gathered here in this sanctuary or on Zoom, draw us to you once again and receive our worship and praise. In the name of Christ our Lord, amen. God wants us to come to him, to confess our sins, to ask for forgiveness. Please join me now in the prayer of confession. Loving and forgiving God, you know us better than we know ourselves. You know those things we hide from others. You know those struggles deep within our hearts. You know that the things we should do, we don't. And the things we shouldn't do, those are the things we do. Have mercy on us, forgive us again, and send us from this place renewed to serve you wherever you have called us by the power of your Son, our Lord. Amen. And now listen to the words of assurance. The amazing truth of the gospel is this. While we were still sinners, when we had turned our backs on God, Christ died for us. God's love is that unconditional. And then Christ rose and conquered sin and death. Because of this truth and the heart of our God who comes to us again and again, we are forgiven. May that scandalous and undeserving truth renew us as we rededicate ourselves to God. We're getting there. It sounds like it's on. Good. Thank you. Thanks, everybody, for your patience. Okay, we got some great answers from you guys <laughs> to put my stuff in. Um, okay, so we're going to talk about the pulpit for a few minutes, okay? 
When the church first started to meet, and I'm going to look at you, but I'm also going to look at them because it's for them as much as it is for you and me. Um, when the first the church first gathered after Jesus died and went to heaven, where did they meet? In people's homes, right? They had small gatherings, like you might have a Bible study. And so what did they do there? They praised God. They shared food like we do with the Lord's Supper, but they actually shared meals together. They um, heard from people who had actually walked with Jesus. Amazing, right? So um, they didn't need a pulpit because they sat around in a circle or whatever, right? So then the church began to grow and it got bigger and bigger and they needed a building because the homes weren't, just weren't big enough. So they started meeting in churches. And I would gather, I don't know for a fact, but I would gather they had something to put their stuff on, <laughs> right? So then what happened was the church got bigger and bigger and something not so good happened. Um, the people like me who were in charge, they sort of took over, okay? So they started having worship in a language that people didn't understand. Can you imagine coming in here and we're speaking Czechoslovakian or something like that? Isn't that weird? They read the Bible and they preached from Latin and nobody knew Latin, but they didn't not come because the leaders of the church made it pretty clear to them that if they didn't show up, they'd go to hell. So they came anyway, isn't that interesting? And they had some kind of a pulpit, but you know what they actually did? They hid it. They put it behind a screen that was nicely decorated with a painting. So, okay, you couldn't see, you couldn't hear, and it was in a language you couldn't understand anyway. So then along comes a person we all know about, right? Martin Luther. And he was reading the Bible and he was thinking, hey, wait a minute. This isn't the stuff that it talks about in the Bible. So people started reading their Bibles. By the way, that was also a time when printing press came. So people could read their Bibles. And they decided that things had to change. And we call that the Reformation. We're going we're gonna to celebrate that the last Sunday of October. So it's very interesting. I did a paper on this. Um, they went into churches that had been the way I talked about before, and they rearranged the furniture. You imagine change, oh my gosh. <laughs> and they made it so that people could see when somebody was reading the Bible, or when someone was preaching. Sometimes they had a move. Um, you, you see some of the diagrams, they had, they had church in the round because it was so important. The, the bottom line for the Reformation is that the most important thing ever is the Bible, right? So that's the most important thing, people, how to be able to hear and see. So um, some pulpits were put really high so that everybody could see. And when I served at a church in Scotland, I had to uh, climb those winding stairs up to the pulpit that was way up high. And I got to tell you, once I forgot my glasses and I had to come all the way down, it was pretty <laughs> embarrassing. But the reason for that was so that everyone could see and hear, right? Now, come on over here, Greg. I want you to look behind the curtain. <laughs> What do you see up here? A lot of my stuff, right? <laughs> What's this? Bible. The Bible is in the most important place. And there's a clock there to make sure I don't go too long. And this is my sermon, right? And I actually have a glass of water. It's my stuff, right? But the reason that the pulpit is so important in our churches is so that when we see it, we are reminded of how important the Bible is and how important Jesus is in our lives, right? And I was saying to Carol before we started, when we come to church, we get ready to leave. Doesn't that sound crazy? But when we come to church, we learn how to live for God, right? Because we're reading the Bible, because we're hearing about Jesus, so that when we go out, we can tell other people. Okay? So now you've seen behind, you've seen all my stuff, bud. Thank you. Uh, let's pray together. Repeat after me. Holy God, we thank you that you love us. And when we look back at the way the church was, we see really good things and things that needed to change. And that's probably true today, too. So open our hearts so that we may hear you speak to us. Amen. Thank you. Thank all of you.
and you're leaving for Sunday school and I'm still out on sound. Did somebody say you're all right? That was so kind of you, thank you. I can always use that. <laughs> okay, our first scripture passage. Um, and before we do that, we're gonna have a time of stilling. And we're gonna end this time of stilling with singing. We're gonna sing the refrain of a song I think you know, and that will be our prayer for God's spirit to come among us, okay? So let's have some quiet time when we get our hearts ready to listen to what God is saying to us this morning. Silently now I wait for thee, ready my God, thy will to see. Open my heart, illumine me, spirit Our first reading from the Bible is a Passover lesson from Hebrews 4, verses 12 through 16. For the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the, the division of soul and spirit, of joints and marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. And before him, no, no creature is hidden, but all are open and laid bare to the eyes of him with whom we have to do. Since then, we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. Let us hold fast our confession. For we have not a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sinning. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Thank you so much, Cindy. Our second passage is a gospel lesson and it comes from the gospel of Mark. And I am going to be reading this morning and it's up on the screen too from a different version. It's called the Common English Translation and it's very, very close to the original language. And it's a little bit more, almost you never, sometimes you don't even notice there's a change, but sometimes it's a little bit more clear to understand. So I like to use this um, often. Okay. Mark 10, beginning at verse 17. As Jesus continued down the road, a man ran up, knelt before him, and asked, Good teacher, what must I do to obtain eternal life? Jesus replied, Why do you call me good? No one is good except the one God. You know the commandments. Don't murder. Don't commit adultery. Don't steal. Don't give false witness. Don't commit murder. I think I've got these, I've missed a line here. We're getting there. Um, don't cheat and honor your father and mother. Teacher, he responded, I have kept all of these things since I was a boy. Jesus looked at him carefully and loved him. He said, you are lacking one thing. Go sell what you own and give the money to the poor. Then you will have treasure in heaven. And come, follow me. But the man was dismayed at this statement and went away saddened 
In the other translation, it says grieving. He went away grieving because he had many possessions. Looking around, Jesus said to his disciples, it will be very hard for the wealthy to enter God's kingdom. His words startled the disciples. So Jesus told them again, children, it is difficult to enter God's kingdom. This is that funny line that we always kind of wonder about. It's easier for a camel to squeeze through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter God's kingdom. They were shocked even more and said to each other, then who can be saved? Jesus looked at them carefully and said, it is impossible with human beings, but not with God. All things are possible for God. Peter said to him, look, we've left everything and followed you. Jesus said, I assure you that anyone who has left house, brothers, sisters, mothers, fathers, children, or farms because of me, and because of the good news, will receive 100 times as much now in this life, houses, brothers, sisters, mothers, children, and farms, with harassment, and in the coming age, eternal life. But many who are first will be last, and many who are last will be first. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. <laughs> Greetings again to all of you and those of you who are watching from afar. He's making a list, checking it twice. Gonna find out who's naughty or nice. How many of you are a list person? How many of you make lists? I do. <laughs> I like to get things done. I'm organized and most of the time at least. And lists help me to do that. I even have a pad and a pencil near my bed because sometimes in the middle of the night, these brilliant ideas <laughs> come to me and I need to write them down or I may forget them by the morning. So I add them. <laughs> To my list. Our calendars and organizers are list keepers too. This passage from the lectionary this morning, it's an interesting one. And what does it have to do with lists? Let's take a closer look. In the common um, English Bible, the heading for this section is the rich man's question. This man comes to Jesus and it seems he is sincere. And it's not an uncommon question at that, right? What do I need to do to get to heaven? Or, or put another way, what can I do to be assured that death is not the end? And what struck me was Jesus' answer. Notice Jesus doesn't tell him to pray more or read his Bible every day, to attend synagogue every week or teach Sunday school or go to seminary. Jesus offers a list. You know the commandments, Jesus says. And then he presents a list of them. Don't murder, commit adultery, don't steal, don't lie, don't cheat, and, and be sure you honor your mom and your dad. Lessons, by the way, our Sunday school kids are learning right now. They're studying the Ten Commandments. Now, if you notice, the list from Jesus comes from the second tablet of the commandments, the ones about how we live in relationship with each other. That first part is all how we live in relationship to God. It's about murder and adultery and stealing and lying and cheating and how you treat your parents. All commandments about actions towards other people. Jesus shifts the goal from what to do to get to heaven to how to live together with people on earth. And this list is how we love our neighbors that second tablet of the, of, of the commandments. To Jesus, this list is central to the life of God's people. This is Jesus' answer to that important question, what do I do to gain eternal life? And the reply of the rich man, I've kept all these things since I was a boy. Murder, nope, check. Adultery, nope, check. Stealing, nope, check. Lying, nope, check. Cheating, nope, check. Honoring mom and dad, yes, check. 
for this rich man that list has been taken care of. He's made a list and checked it twice and found out that he's not naughty, but nice. <laughs> and I can imagine he felt pretty proud of himself. But that's the point. It's not about checking a list or feeling smug. And what the text says next is the best part of the passage for me. Jesus doesn't tell him to repent or embarrass him. Jesus never mocks this man. Jesus doesn't reprimand him. Jesus is not impatient with him. What we read are those wonderful words Jesus looked at him. And that doesn't mean just a glance. Jesus looked into his heart. And Jesus loved him. That's the highlight of the text for me. Jesus looked at him. And Jesus loved him. Even though Jesus knows that this rich man doesn't quite get it, even though Jesus knows that this man checks off lists, Jesus sees that this man truly wants to know the answer. Jesus is all about love, and that's exactly what Jesus is getting at in this whole conversation and teaching moment. That's Jesus' heart. That's God's heart. I guess that's why I love this text so much. Jesus looked at him and loved him. And, and that reminds me of that turn of the words, Jesus loves me, this I know, to Jesus knows me, this I love. Together they express this verse. Isn't that good news? And then Jesus loving him tells him the hard truth because that's what loving is sometimes. You lack something, dear sir. And that makes no sense to the rich man because he's got everything he can imagine, right? There are lessons behind each commandment as we live with each other. There are words behind the words. They're not done when we check off a list. It's about how we live our lives every day, week, month, year, a lifetime. This message is for us too. We also have lists we check off, and that's really legalism. Come to church on Sunday, check. Watch on Zoom, check. Serve on a committee, check. Teach Sunday school, check. Don't cheat on my income tax, check. Stop at red lights, check. Keep to the speed limit. I can't say I do, so I wouldn't be able to check that one off. See, decent living, a moral life is not enough. It's not about checking a list. Jesus knows the heart of this rich man and points to the hindrance of his faith and living. The one thing that was lacking, his willingness to open his arms, his life, and his wallet. His treasures are bound in his worldly wealth. He lacks a willingness to think beyond it. Following Jesus means that self is not the center. Jesus is. It's, it's not about the stuff we own or a bank account or investments, even if that's the way the world sees it. Following Jesus is about how we live with people and care about them with a heart like Jesus. Following Jesus is about willing to love God and our neighbor above ourselves, words we know so well. And that's the one thing this rich man is lacking. He finds his value, his identity, his worth in his wealth. Jesus is actually asking this man to give up the way he sees the world and lives in it. To realize that wealth and everything connected to wealth are not things to cling to above everything else. Those things get in the way of following Jesus. Without knowing it, they can become the most important in our lives. This man must empty himself, make real life for God, God's kingdom, God's way, God's love, not just lists. Jesus is not suggesting an easy thing. And that's why he uh, presents it in such drastic terms, giving it all away. Because what Jesus is suggesting is that drastic to our way of thinking, too. I don't believe that Jesus is suggesting that wealth is wrong. But it can be if we value it too much, if it rules our lives. 
And the rich man is not willing to accept that. That's clear in the way he walks away, grieving, saddened. He's not ready for a change of heart. Wealth has such power over us all. It's amazing. We live in this consumer society, let's be honest. Who goes to Target and comes back without buying something, right? We're just too comfortable. We're not willing to give that up. And Jesus knows that. And that's why he uses that incredulous example of a camel trying to get through an eye of a needle. Impossible. This rich man and we too are being challenged by Jesus to a whole new way of life, an alternative narrative to the world in which God reigns and is so sovereign, a life where status and power and entitlement and privilege are not important. Look at the life of Jesus, a world in which we are willing to take a good look at ourselves and recognize these same things in our lives and make changes. Walking away grieving because he just couldn't do it. Jesus demands a whole new worldview of us too. Jesus invites this rich man to unburden himself, to unload his burden of wealth. His hold on wealth is his downfall, and Jesus knows it. This rich man loves things and wealth too much. His wealth binds him from freely giving his heart and life. He doesn't realize it, like most of us, that abundance has created a lack in his life. And the only way he can fill this gaping hole is by giving of his abundance and even more, letting go of his understanding that wealth is more important than life is itself, even eternal life. Jesus' invitation, come follow me, puts Jesus as the way, Jesus as the life and the truth, knowing and following Jesus and his ministry. Following Jesus literally means putting Jesus in first place because everything else makes sense in him. Lists. They're not necessarily bad. They're good when they guide us and hold us accountable. But we have to be careful how we think about them and about checking them off. Jesus is teaching through this conversation, through this list of commandments, that living in God's kingdom is not so much about wealth. It's about how we use it in Christ's name. Following Jesus turns the status quo on its head. The way of Christ is contrary to the way of the world in every aspect. And that challenges, I, I want to believe, probably the hardest challenge we all face. So the disciples question that follows rings in our ears then, who can be saved? Who can do that? To face the thought of seeing the world differently and living it so seems preposterous to us. Jesus knows that. That's why he says it's impossible for humans, but not for God. And then Jesus, brilliantly, as Jesus often does, sums it up in this mind-boggling phrase, the first will be last. Hmm. Take a moment and let those words sink in. Not just a phrase Jesus said, but words for us. The first shall be last. <laughs> Say what? We're kind of the first, aren't we? first world country, first to get vaccines, little need. The idea that we might be last, ouch. And the last will be first? Who may they be the way we see the world? They ahead of us? I can hardly accept that, can you? It does require a whole new worldview. The first will be last. 
and the last will be first. That makes no sense in our world and culture. Not something we can get our heads around. Living in God's kingdom requires sacrifice, self-denial, sharing with those in need, in need of love, of respect, of honor, of care, everything needed to flourish. It's a way we live. Those we consider last first, we better give that some thought. Our class this past Thursday night, Understanding Cultural Differences, has the goal of helping us to do that. If you were there, you know how great it was. And if you missed it, come this Thursday night, even if you weren't there last week. See, Jesus is not talking about works righteousness. We don't make our way to heaven by any of these things. Following Jesus, living this way, is a response to the embrace of God that stands firm. Being a follower of Jesus demands action of the heart, lived out in our lives, reflecting God's embrace. This is what discipleship is all about, a response to God's gift of grace. We live as an act of gratitude. Jesus looks at this rich man and loves him. And that doesn't change even as the rich man walks away grieving. We don't really know the end of this story for this guy. Who knows? He may determine a different response in a day, a week, a month, a year. He may reflect and contemplate and eventually do exactly what Jesus was encouraging to him to do. That is a possible ending to this story because all things are possible with God. Such a turn in his life, in our lives, can only happen, can only be possible by open hearts and the power of God's spirit walking among us. If we're honest, we walk away grieving too. God is asking so much. The good news of the gospel is that God keeps nudging us. The door is never closed. The open arms of Christ wait for us to come to our senses. That's what the word grace is all about. Jesus looks at you and me, and Jesus loves us and wants us to follow him in every way that that requires. Let's pray that we have the ears to hear and to think on this conversation between Jesus and this rich man and the disciples and the courage to think about what's going on in our hearts, about the lists we make and all we possess. I was thinking last night, you may say that this is kind of a stewardship Sunday. That wasn't my intention, but if the shoe fits, Stewardship Sunday is right around the corner. I actually believe that stewardship is the other side of the coin to discipleship. It's how we live, how we love, and how we follow Jesus. It's a different world view. And Jesus is waiting for us to get the picture. Thanks be to God. And all God's people say, Amen. Let us pray together. O oh, love divine, be thou our eyes, that we may see clearly. Be thou our feet, that we may walk along your paths, that we may be a benevolent presence on life's highway. Open our hearts so that compassion may be our companion. Amen. We're going to sing number 422, God who's loving knows no ending.
Please be seated. It's the time for us to give of our gifts. Um, and we do so now as we enjoy the gift of love that Ellen has prepared for us. God, you love us so much. It's hard for us to comprehend. And you know our hearts. So we, um, 
We trust that you love us anyway. Receive these gifts, O oh Lord, that we give to you and all the other ways we serve you. May they please you, O oh Lord, even when we sometimes get it wrong. Use these gifts and all of our gifts to further your kingdom of love and justice in this world. For we are the body of Christ. We pray this in your name. Amen. Please be seated. This is the time in the service where we share our joys and concerns. And Carol, we were wondering if you would be willing to walk around with the microphone. Thank you so much. While we get started, I wanted to share a joy with you that I found out this morning. 14 youth joined Mrs. Metherall and Mrs. Gaskell for a corn maze at uh, Zerpentine Farms and then a bonfire back at the Metheralls. And I can only imagine how wonderful it must have been for them to all gather together again. Um, so joy is, and many thanks to Ruth and Donna as well. Anybody else have something to share either in Zoom, from Zoom or in our sanctuary? Okay, would you please bow your head in prayer? I have one. Oh, I'm sorry. That's okay. Sorry, Deborah. Just Ron's cousin Janice Carr is struggling with her leukemia. She had a reaction to the chemo and she has to stay in the hospital two more weeks and try again. Lord, hear our prayer. I'm sorry. Lord, hear our prayer. I have one. Um, Sandy had texted me that she has a niece, Heather Cameron, I think is her name. Um, she has, she was in Cleveland for biopsies and they found that she has throat and lung and lympho, lymph, lymph node um, cancer. So we pray for her as she is understandably struggling with this news. And of course we can think of um, Stephanie Cassidy in that same regard, right? Lord, hear our prayers. Hey, would you please bow your head in prayer? Our Heavenly Father, you have heard some of our joys and concerns already this morning, and you already know the ones that are on our heart and in our minds that went unspoken, but you hear those. We certainly ask for prayers for continued healing and strength and recovery for Stephanie, for Jim, for Bonnie, for Michelle, for Ryder, for Nora and Tom. And for those of us that are feeling anxiety, we ask you for assurance and peace. Those that are injured or ill or facing surgery or post-surgery, we ask you for your healing, your strength, and helping them to recover. Those people that are grieving or sad, we ask you for your comfort for them and your blessing. Those of us that might be feeling lost, we ask for your guidance. Those of us in our faith community, those facing difficult decisions, guidance and clarity, trust. Those of us that are caring for others, families, friends, we ask you for energy and stamina. We thank you for your unconditional and constant and steadfast love, O oh Lord. Hear us now as we say the prayer you taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We give us today our daily bread and we forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors and lead us not to temptation, 
but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Those of you that are able, we're going to now stand and sing hymn number 420. And we're going to do just verses one through three and five. And it's called the God of grace and God of glory. Announcements are found at the um, end of the bulletin, and we want to extend happy birthday wishes to Kelly and Pam this week. And then our touch cards this week are to thank Donna Metherall, Reverend Eileen, and Dennis Dupree for their service here at OPC. Um, this week, women's and men's Bible study groups will be meeting. If you haven't joined them yet, I know that we would love to have you join us. There is some information about the upcoming packing and delivery for the South Wedge Food Program, uh, the fellowship luncheon outing, and then the Spencer Port Food Shelf is in need of the canned pasta. 
And as always, we remember Mary Lou Maynard as well. We're now going to um, watch an updated video on the Operation Christmas Child. That's our minute for mission. And further information is also found in the bulletin. Seeing a child open the boxes for the first time is just, it's incredible. There's squeals and screams, and they are so excited to see what's inside their box. Oh my goodness! Every shoebox gives represents the love of God to them. We are so excited. Many of the children receive the shoeboxes for the first time in their life. We're here with Operation Christmas Child. The kids are so excited. We had the opportunity to hand out some of the boxes. There's so much joy, so much happiness, and it gives us an opportunity to present the gospel. We pray that these boxes will be used to bring a lot of happiness and joy, but more importantly, the gospel to each heart, all these little children around the world. What a great gift. I get a present, I get to know who Jesus is, but not only that, I get to be discipled in his ways. Hundreds of thousands of volunteers work with Operation Christmas Child every year, preparing these boxes, praying for the boxes, that God will use them in a mighty way for His glory. This little shoe box has the opportunity to change the world. Not only are they going to get a shoe box, they're going to get the love and the message of Jesus Christ. Some go by helicopter, some go by ship, some go by camel, donkeys, canoes. We go at great lengths to take these boxes to children in the most remote parts of the world. And it's an incredible journey. After these children open the box, they have the opportunity to go through the greatest journey, the 12 lesson discipleship program, where they get to learn more about Jesus Christ. Right now, I'm right outside of Mazlan, Mexico, about six hour drive up in the mountains. This is an indigenous people group, people that never heard the gospel before. The kids and the families that accepted Christ, almost a hundred altogether, have now started a church. Hemos visto una experiencia preciosa, grande, verdad, en el pueblo. Y ese pueblo va a ser el medio para llevar el evangelio a otro lugar. Que estas bendiciones que son de las cajitas. This shoe box gives us an opportunity to continue to shine the bright light of the gospel in the darkest and remote places around the world. We're seeing families come to know Jesus. Churches are sprouting up in these communities. These children are rising up to be disciples in their own country. The gift box and the gospel of Jesus Christ bring hope to our children to bring the smiles back on their faces. No greater need and no greater time than right now for us to go out and serve boldly. This is what these shoe boxes are all about, to go out and bring a hope of Jesus Christ around the world. I'm just so amazed at what God does each and every year. This is an opportunity to impact the lives of millions of children, just like you've seen. But we need more boxes for next year. Every box is an opportunity for us to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. So thank you. And God bless each and every one. I ask that you stand for the benediction. And Nikki, I want to thank you for all your work this morning with two videos and everything. And just a quick announcement too, uh, Roger Howlett also had surgery this past week and came home doing very well. He had hip replacement surgery. So as we go from this place, we said we come here to get prepared to leave. As we go, go with God's blessing, God who loves us so much. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord turn his face toward you and me and give us peace and all else it is that we need. And in receiving God's loving blessing, all God's people say, 
Amen. <laughs> Thank you.